Hello and welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. My name is Carrie Hazley and I am the Chief of the National Weather Service Alaska's Emergency Services and Multimedia Branch. You may have noticed that the Alaska Weather Show has been off the air for the last several days and we're excited to begin producing the show once again. Just like folks all around Alaska and all around the world, the National Weather Service Alaska team is committed to slowing the spread of the coronavirus, also known as COVID-19. Most of our employees are now working from home, following guidelines to practice social distancing. This allows us to adequately spread out our team members who continue to work in offices, producing the weather forecasts and warnings Alaskans depend on. The show will look a bit different to you in the days ahead because the TV team is now producing the show from our porches, from our living rooms, and from our spare bedrooms. Some of the maps will look different than those that you are used to seeing, but we will continue to build up our remote capability and improve the TV program. I hope that you will stick with us as we learn a completely new way of producing the weather show. While there is a lot of uncertainty in the world and in Alaska right now, please know that our commitment to serving the people of this great state with the best weather information we can provide remains unchanged. Thank you for your viewership and please stay safe, fellow Alaskans. Good evening, I'm David Kramer with Alaska Weather. Thanks for joining us this evening and seeing our new setup here as we work from our homes to deliver weather into your homes. As always, you can visit our weather info or call our weather info line at 1-800-472-0391. Get the updates to the forecast, who that means. Or you can visit our website, weather.gov slash Alaska. Get the updates to our watches, mornings, advisories, or forecasts that we have out for your area. And you can email me at the address at the bottom of the screen, david.kramer at noaa.gov. Starting off for the warnings that we do have out, we have one winter weather advisory for blowing snow. It's in the northeastern part of the Brooks Range, in effect from midnight tonight on Wednesday night until noon on Thursday. That is primarily for the passes in the area of the northwest Brooks Range. Watch out if you're going through those areas. We will see some blowing snow conditions tonight into tomorrow. Taking a look at our satellite imagery, we have several features moving through the area. Starting way out west by the western Aleutians, we have a new system coming in, bringing some cloud cover, but also bringing some precipitation towards the area, pushing into the western part of the Bering Sea. Watching this loop again, we'll start off in the areas of the North Pacific, south of the Alaska Peninsula. We have system bringing in some cloud cover and precipitation towards the Alaska Peninsula as well. You can watch again out a little bit further to the north. We have some cloud cover pushing in over the west coast of the state, bringing some cloud cover to the area. And then finally, as we move out over the eastern part of the mainland and for the Alaska Peninsula, we do have some high pressure helping to keep away a lot of the cloud cover and precipitation in those areas. So looking now at our weather for the remainder of the day, we do have that system pushing into the western Bering, starting to bring some snow to areas in the western and northern part of the Bering Sea, but not quite making it to the western Aleutians yet as high pressure in the North Pacific dominates the central and western Aleutian Islands. Out over the North Pacific, headed towards the Alaska Peninsula, we have a trough there bringing some rain and snow, enough warm air with that to bring some rain, especially towards the Kodiak Island side. But as we get further to the north and further inland, we are expecting that to be primarily snow up the west coast of the state towards the western part of the Seward Peninsula. As we look out a little bit further to the east for the Kenai Peninsula area, we will see some snow making it there. Some areas are going to be a little bit protected by the mountains for some of the precipitation, but starting to make its way up parts of Cook Inlet as well. Out over the interior part of the mainland and the Arctic coastline, not expecting a lot in terms of precipitation, as high pressure out over the northern part of Canada is pushing in just enough to hold that precipitation at bay. And also down over the southeastern part of the state over the Panhandle, we are expecting to keep precipitation well away from the area for the remainder of today. For tonight, we will have a trough over the area, but high pressure is still dominant enough to keep precipitation out of the Panhandle area. As we move out over the mainland part of the state, west part of the interior, all the way along the west coast of the state, down into the Bristol Bay area, expecting to see snow, some from a trough up to the northwestern part of the state. Also an area of deformation, it's stretching down across southwest Alaska, bringing in snow to the Bristol Bay area, Alaska Peninsula. A little bit warmer on the Gulf side as we have some rain over Kodiak Island, but mixing back to snow as we get back into Prince William Sound and much of the Kenai Peninsula. Out over the Bering Sea, we do have a low pressure system moving through the northern part of the Bering, bringing a mix of snow and rain towards the St. Matthew Island area, but high pressure keeping the Aleutian Islands void of the precipitation for tonight. However, as we move into Thursday, that high is going to start to push off further to the east as a new system comes in from the North Pacific, bringing in some rain to the western Aleutian Islands. Our other system that was 
out over the northwestern part of the Bering will now be over the northern part of the Bering, bringing some snow to areas along the west coast up to the Norton Sound and Seward Peninsula areas. There will also be some snow showers out over the Kotzebue Sound area and northwestern parts of mainland Alaska. And throughout much of the interior, some snow is expected from the Brooks Range through the interior down into south central Alaska as well, where we will start to see some warmer air mixing that snow with rain for Kodiak Island and southern portions of the Kenai Peninsula. Down over the Panhandle area, high pressure still keeping precipitation out of the area. Nice weather continuing for Thursday for the Panhandle. As we move into Friday, low pressure out over the northeastern part of the Gulf of Alaska, bringing in some snow to northern places of the Panhandle. However, as we get closer towards the Gulf and further to the south, expecting warmer air to transition that snow over to rain. Mainland Alaska will see uh, snow showers throughout from the Brooks Range south through the interior down into south central Alaska, some mix of rain and snow around Prince William Sound. Further up north along the Arctic coastline, snow shouldn't quite make it there being hung up on the Brooks Range, but we will see snow down the west coast of the state, down into the YK Delta area, where a warm front pushing in will start to transition that snow over to rain with some warmer air pushing through the Bering Sea, and some of that warmer air will also bring some rain to the Pribilof Islands. Much of the Alaska Peninsula and eastern Aleutians will be covered by high pressure, keeping the rain further to the north and west, where the central and western Aleutians are expected to see some rain. For our temperatures, starting off in the Aleutian Islands, Thursday morning lows, we are expecting temperatures to drop into the mid-30s. Moving up into mainland part of the state, starting in southwest Alaska, around Bristol Bay, expecting temperatures to drop right around 30 degrees. In the teens for the YK Delta area and up along the west coast to the Seward Peninsula area and through Point Hope and Point Lay. Along the Arctic coastline, expecting temperatures to go into the single digits until we get further to the east by Dead Horse and Kaktovik, where we will drop below zero. Down much of the interior, staying above zero, zero except for Arctic Village, but western portions of the interior down to around 20 degrees into the teens for central and then single digits for eastern parts of the interior. Down into the mid-20s for much of south-central Alaska, with Glen Allen getting a little bit colder, dropping down to about 1 degree above zero. Down in the Panhandle area, right around 20 degrees for the most part. Uh, quite a bit of a range, however, anywhere from the mid-teens to the mid-20s. Moving into our Thursday afternoon highs, we are expecting temperatures in the Panhandle to get up to the lower 40s. Mid 30s for much of south central Alaska. Kodiak a little bit warmer, 42 degrees is expected. Into the 30s all throughout the interior part of the state, and as we get closer towards the Brooks Range in the 20s, and the upper teens along the Arctic coastline. Down the west coast of the state, expecting mid 20s and then around 30 degrees for the YK Delta, mid 30s for the Bristol Bay area, then into the lower 40s for the Aleutian Islands. Our lows for Friday morning for the Aleutians dropping back down into the mid 30s, down into the mid 20s for the Bristol Bay area and much of the west coast into the teens around the Kotzebue Sound area, single digits along the Arctic coastline, right around 20 degrees for much of the interior, right around 30 degrees for south central Alaska and the mid 20s for the Panhandle. Friday afternoon highs getting to the mid 30s to right around 40 degrees for the Panhandle, up to around 40 degrees for south central Alaska and into the 30s for the interior, into the teens for the Arctic coastline and just above, above 30 degrees for all along the west coast of the state and into the mid 40s for much of the Aleutian Islands. 38 degrees expected high for St. Paul. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. For aviation, we'll start off with our flying weather on Thursday morning. Out over the Bering Sea, we can see some IFR conditions in the northern part of the Bering, however, VFR conditions for much of the Aleutian Islands. Stretching out to the Alaska Peninsula, we do have some areas of IFR that extend out over Kodiak Island as well and up much of the west coast of the state into western portions of the interior and up into the Susitna Valley. We also have around the Kenai Peninsula some IFR conditions on the eastern side and for western Prince William Sound, but as we push further to the east, we are expecting conditions to clear up to VFR on Thursday morning throughout much of the Panhandle as well. And then as we move up along the North Slope Coast, it's primarily VFR conditions for Thursday morning. As we move into Thursday afternoon, MVFR conditions for the Arctic coastline and MVFR through the Brooks Range as well into central portions of the interior and a lot of IFR conditions for south central Alaska. Down in the Panhandle area, expecting primarily VFR conditions. And along the west coast of the state, primarily MVFR as we move down into the YK Delta area, but as we get closer to Bristol Bay, some of those conditions in proving to VFR conditions, and then VFR through the Aleutians until we get to the Western Aleutians with that next system coming in, we are expecting some IFR conditions. 
for Friday morning, that frontal system pushing further into the Bering Sea, bringing IFR conditions just to the west of the Pribilof Islands and out through the central Aleutian Islands. Out along the west coast, we are expecting IFR conditions from the Bis Bristol Bay area up through the YK Delta and up into the Seward Peninsula. Up along the northwestern coast, we do expect some MVFR conditions, primarily with some isolated areas of IFR. Down into the interior part of the state, we're expecting a mixture of MVFR and IFR conditions and more IFR conditions as we push further to the south into south central Alaska. Panhandle area will still be primarily VFR on Friday morning. Friday afternoon, expecting those IFR conditions to push well into the Panhandle area, widespread IFR conditions expected. For south central Alaska, a lot of VFR conditions for western portions downgrading to MVFR conditions as we move into the Copper River Basin and eastern portions of Prince William Sound. Up in the interior part of the state, primarily MVFR conditions, and along the Arctic coastline, primarily MVFR conditions, especially for the central and western locations. Down the west coast of the state, all MVFR conditions are expected until we get down to the YK Delta, where we'll start to see a mixture of IFR conditions with that next front pushing in. Then out over the Bering Sea, MVFR and IFR conditions, until we get down to the eastern Aleutians, where they're still going to remain VFR. Moving into the passes, starting up North Antarctic Pass, expected to be MVFR throughout the day on Thursday. Adigan Pass should be IFR throughout the day. Lake Clark and Merrill both expected to be IFR. Rainy Pass should also be IFR through the day. Windy Pass expected to be MVFR. Isabel Pass, VFR dropping down to marginal conditions in the afternoon. Mintasta Pass, VFR dropping down to marginal as well. Tanita Pass, staying marginal throughout the day. Portage should be IFR throughout the day. Chilkoot and White, however, will stay nice and VFR throughout all day on Thursday. Taking a look now at our freezing levels, we'll watch our surface freezing lines starting off by the Panhandle area, riding along the North Gulf Coast, down into the Alaska Peninsula, and out up into the northern part of the Barren Sea. We'll also see our Higher level freezing lines, 2,000 feet right into the southern part of the Bering Sea. Some warmer air out by the western Aleutians, bringing up to 8,000 feet. So look out over by the Kodiak Island area, another uh, spot of warmer air getting pushed up from the south towards Kodiak Island and out by the Barren Islands. Looking now at our icing, we'll start off in the western portions of the Bering Sea below 8,000 feet there as we get by the west coast of the state, extending up into the Kotzebue Sound area below 8,000 feet there, below 8,000 feet from much of the eastern portion of mainland Alaska down through south central, and then below 13,000 feet as we move out over the Gulf. Taking a look at our jet stream, a little different chart here. We do have some westerly flow out over the central part of the Bering Sea, getting up to as high as 150 knots as it drops down over the Alaska Peninsula, around 100 knots there, or 100 miles per hour, sorry. These are all in miles per hour and not knots is our normal jet stream. Out over the mainland part of the state, 90 knots the, or 90 miles per hour through the Cook Inlet area, dropping down to 70 miles per hour to get into the northeastern part of the state. Lower speeds around 50 knots as we are 50 miles per hour to get to the northwestern portion of the state. Down over the Panhandle area, around 80 miles per hour out of a northerly direction. Taking us to 9,000 feet, we do have 30 miles per hour out of a northerly direction out over the Panhandle. 30 to 40 knots, 40 miles per hour rather, out of a southwesterly direction over south central Alaska, out over the southern portions of the Bering Sea, out of a westerly direction as high as 80 miles per hour. Down to 3,000 feet, westerly winds 70 to 80 miles per hour for the southern Bering, dropping down to 20 to 30 out over mainland Alaska. And then for our turbulence below 4,000 feet for the Aleutian Islands, below 4,000 feet for the Cook Inlet, Kodiak Island areas up into the southwestern portions of the interior. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and today I'm privileged to introduce Dr. Uccellini, the director of the United States National Weather Service. Welcome back to Alaska, sir. Thank you, Dave. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, prior to be being the leader of the National Weather Service, uh, your work included an extensive look at snowstorms across the northeastern United States. These are the types of storms that can bring some of the country's largest cities to its knees. Uh, tell me a little bit about your fascination with snow. Well, as far back as I can remember, I've, I've always been interested in, in weather, mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a, as a kid in, uh, on Long Island, New York, and was particularly fascinated by uh, snowstorms. Um, why they occurred. The distribution of snow was very varied across the entire region. The rain snow line, all those things fascinated me right from the get-go. And um, I was interested in knowing how they worked, um, how the forecast worked, or more often than not, didn't work uh, uh, one way or the other. And that drove me, um, uh, that interest continued to build in um, 
drove me through high school right into college uh, wanting to be a meteorologist. Okay, that's a fascinating story, and I think every meteorologist has a weather story like that in some way. Right. Uh, due to Alaska's size and the proximity to the North Pole, sometimes it's difficult to detect and analyze the weather patterns over Alaska. Uh, what's the National Weather Service doing to improve that weather detection? Well, uh, observations uh, in this type of an environment is, is a big challenge, uh, whether it's um, from space um, or uh, from what we call in-situ observations from the, from the ground or within the systems. Mm -hmm. Um, clearly, uh, satellites have been playing an increasing role in providing uh, the big picture, uh, not only from a visual sense and what you see is occurring, um, but also from providing the data for numerical models that then are used to actually predict the weather. Uh, Alaska is actually pretty well uh, positioned with respect to polar orbiting satellites since you get a, f um, a, a faster return of those satellites over your particular area. And in fact, the, uh, the polar satellite system is the backbone for the observations that we use in our models, uh, especially our global models, and they're particularly important uh, for observing weather features that affect Alaska. Alaskans live and die by the weather every day. And one of the strategic goals of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Weather Service is to develop a more weather-ready nation. What does it mean for Alaskans to be weather-ready? Well, the, the strategic outcome is based on uh, people being ready, responsive, and therefore resilient to uh, the increasing uh, threats to extreme weather events. Uh, those threats are related to um, not only the nature of the events, but the fact that we're becoming more vulnerable to them as we have more people, more infrastructure uh, that could be um, affected by these events. So we have to ensure that the observations we make for situational awareness, the forecasts we make for people to take the proper responses um, are connected uh, to people's uh, actions, uh, the response to these events, so that uh, they will be more resilient uh, to um, uh, what's uh, facing them. Um, you know, there are examples with respect to hurricanes, uh, more people living along the coastline takes longer to evacuate. We have to make better forecasts with longer lead times, but we also have to communicate the threat so people will actually take action to avoid those storms. Up here you have, um, as in other parts of the United States, an increasing threat related to fire. Mm -hmm. uh, um, as there are more people living in fire-prone areas, um, we have to ensure that our forecasts are good, uh, that we don't have uh, false alarms that make people not react to uh, uh, the forecast when, in fact, they should. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have to be able to communicate the threat to make sure that we're working with the partners in the emergency management community uh, so that um, communities uh, and right down to individuals will actually take the proper responses in the face of these events. So that's the strategic goal. There are a lot of challenges for us terms of improving forecasts, but also improving our communication skills and linking with the emergency management communities that are actually out there uh, trying to protect lives and mitigate property loss. So a huge partnership effort going forward. Uh, that's, that's one of the important keys for the success of uh, meeting the strategic goal. Okay. Well, one of the things you're talking about was uh, understanding the, the weather information we're getting back from the computers, weather modeling, and you did a lot of work with that in some of your prior, uh, prior positions with the Environmental Prediction Center there, the National Center for Environmental Prediction. Um, what can you tell us about recent improvements in that weather modeling? And you're using uh, the polar orbiters as kind of a, a source of information that started right. that process. Well, you know, first of all, we have to recognize that everything you see you read and hear about weather, climate, or ocean forecasts are all driven by numerical models. Now, mm -hmm. it, it really has been the, uh, the revolution in our forecast process uh, in the last part of, um, of the 20th century. Uh, the success of that numerical enterprise is based on three factors. Big computers, mm -hmm. um, po uh, global data, not just local data, but you have to have a global data set and then the models themselves, the science that's behind the models and in running the models um, in an operational mode. So we're working to improve all three of those components. Uh, we um, upgraded our computers last year. We, we're going through another upgrade even as I speak. 
uh, we'll be upgrading from 200 trillion calculations per second to 700 trillion mm -hmm. calculations per second by January of 2015. Uh, this increase in the computer will allow us to run what we call Earth system models. It's not just the atmosphere, it's the atmosphere, ocean, mm -hmm. ice, which is obviously very important up here, and land models that are all coupled together okay. at higher resolution. So you need the big computers, you need the uh, science uh, that allows us to run these models and run them in a parallel mode and that they're coupled so that the ocean effects could affect the atmosphere and vice versa, mm -hmm. as an example. Uh, and then the global observations are absolutely critical and um, over the last 20, 30 years they've become more dependent upon the satellite systems um, and especially the uh, polar orbiting satellites which help drive the, uh, the observations needed for those models, whether they be atmospheric observations, land, ice observations. Um, we're driving more and more of that from satellites now that feed into these models and produce forecasts with extended lead times now, out, you know, for extreme events especially, we're, we're seeing a much improved forecast out in the four, five, six, seven, and even eight day range, which is, gets us back to Weather Ready Nation because if you're going to get ready for a storm event, you want those consistent forecasts approaching that event from day seven, six, five, four, three, mm -hmm. so you can take the actions several days in advance that can help mitigate the property loss and, and, and protect uh, your livelihood. Okay, all part of the mission of protecting life and property. Dr. Uccellini, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And speaking to Alaskans and sharing how the National Weather Service is working for Alaska and the nation. Wish you safe travels around the 49th. Enjoy your time here, sir. And for Alaska Weather Facts, I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder. And now, marine weather around Alaska. For our marine section, we'll start off with a quick look at the ice edge. Stretching through the northern part of the Bering Sea into the eastern part of the Bering, we have had some pushback of the ice in the western and northwestern parts of the Bering Sea as we've had some southerly flow out there. We also have some leads breaking in the ice along the west coast of the state. Those are filling in with uh, some new ice, but be mindful if you're out in those areas that there are some leads in the ice. And then as we move forward in time, we are expecting with that next system coming up, some southerly winds over eastern portions of the Bering, helping to push the ice edge back to the north. However, over western portions of the Bering, some northerly winds starting to bring the ice edge back further to the south in those locations. Taking a look now for our Thursday in southeast Alaska and the inside waters, northerly winds, 15 to 20 knots, and that's going to become westerly at 10 knots as we get further to the south. Out over the Gulf, northwesterly winds 10 to 15 knots, seas as high as 4 feet. Then on Friday, inside waters, southeasterly winds 10 to 15 knots. Then out over the Gulf, westerly winds 15 knots, becoming southeasterly as we get further to the north near Yakutat area. Out over south central Alaska on Thursday, in the uh, Prince William Sound area, southerly winds around 10 knots. So get out in the Gulf, we're going to have some variable winds in the northern part of the Gulf becoming south 15 to 20 knots as we get closer towards the Barren Islands. Out over the Cook Inlet area, we have northeasterly winds starting at 10 knots in the northern sections uh, become increasing as we move further to the south up to as high as 25 knots as we get closer towards St. Augustine Island and that's going to become more southeasterly. Then on Friday, westerly winds throughout the Cook Inlet area 10 to 20 knots in Cook Inlet, as high as 30 knots as we get closer towards the Barren Islands. Then westerly flow in the Gulf of Alaska, 25 to 30 knots there, becoming more northerly as we get by Prince William Sound, 15 knots in that location. For the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island on Thursday, in the Chelikoff Straits, southwesterly winds, 15 knots. On the other side of Kodiak Island, also 15 knots. But as we move further to the southwest, 20 knots and becoming more northerly as we get closer towards Sand Point. Seas as high as 7 feet. And then on the Bering side, 15 to 20 knots out of a westerly direction. On Friday, continuing out of the west for the Bering side, 25 to 35 knots, strongest as we get further to the west. Then on the uh, Pacific side, westerly winds, 25 to 30 knots. That's going to include areas around Kodiak Island as well. Out over the Aleutian Islands on Thursday, we do have primarily westerly winds for the central and eastern Aleutians, 15 to 25 knots, strongest on the Bering side. And as we move out by the western Aleutian Islands, southerly winds, 35 to 45 knots, with seas as high as 14 feet, strongest further to the west. 
on Friday, winds and seas picking up quite a bit for the western Aleutian Islands, 45 knots out of a southwesterly direction. Seas now as high as 31 feet by the western Aleutians. So you move to the central Aleutians, storm force winds 50 knots out of a southerly direction on the Pacific side, or on the Bering side, and then dropping down to around 25 to 35 knots as we get closer towards the eastern Aleutians. Seas as high as 19 feet on the Pacific side for the central Aleutians. Along the west coast of the state, southerly winds 20 knots up in the Norton Sound area, and then 25 to 30 along the rest of the west coast. Seas as high as 13 feet by St. Matthew Island. On Friday, we do have southerly winds along the west coast continuing up by St. Lawrence Island. We have around 15 knots. Stronger as we get further to the south, 30 knots around Saint, or around Nunavik Island, and then 45 knots of a southwesterly direction by the Pribilof Island. Seas as high as 19 feet. Along the Arctic coastline, we have southerly winds 15 to 20 knots, and then down the west coast of the state, 15 knots out of that southerly direction, picking up by the Bering Strait around 25 knots there on Thursday. Then on Friday, winds through the Bering Strait area, southerly 15 knots, becoming more variable as we move up the west coast, 10 to 15 knots, and then variable again along the Arctic coastline around 10 knots. For our weather for the remainder of tonight, we will have a low pressure system moving through the northern part of the Bering Sea, bringing some snow to the St. Matthew Island area as it continues to push to the east, but high pressure further to the south, keeping precipitation out of much of the Aleutian Islands. Along the west coast west and western part of the interior, we do have some troughing bringing in some snow showers to those locations, extending down towards the Alaska Peninsula as well, but as we get by Kodiak, a little bit warmer there, expecting to see primarily rain, and then some snow with a mix of rain by Kachemak Bay for the Kinnak Peninsula area. Area. High pressure keeping precipitation out of the eastern portions of mainland Alaska and down in the Panhandle area. As we move into Thursday, we are expecting that high pressure to remain over parts of southeast Alaska, keeping skies pretty clear. But as we move over mainland Alaska, snow throughout much of the area, especially as we get into the Brooks Range and further to the south, then a mixture of rain and snow for much of the Kenai Peninsula and Kodiak Island, where it's going to be a little bit warmer. Low pressure out over the northern Bering Sea going to bring in some snow to the Seward Peninsula and the White Cay Delta area, and then the next system coming in from the west bringing some rain to the western Aleutian Islands. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Thank <laughs> you.